Hello, I'm Michelle Davis of the Center for Manufacturing Research at Tennessee Tech University in Cookville, Tennessee. Welcome to the Spring 2020 Golden Eagle Additively Innovative Virtual Lecture Series. This is the ninth semester we have produced this popular and informative series. The series is hosted by TTU Center for Manufacturing Research and the iMaker Space at TTU. Additive manufacturing is a focus of both entities and as such, this short virtual lecture series has been planned to highlight the best practices, potential problems, technological advancements, innovations, and scientific contributions in additive manufacturing with expert talks from various institutions, industries, R&D centers, and laboratories. Today, we are honored to hear from Dr. Wen Chao Zhu, Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Arkansas. His talk is titled, From 3D Printing to Digital Manufacturing. The speaker will provide his contact information for questions after the presentation is over. Thank you, and I turn the presentation over to Dr. Zhu. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be here, and I uh, hope everybody is doing well. And so today I'm gonna give a short talk on uh, some of the research we've been doing uh, to uh, develop a 3D printing into a more viable digital manufacturing technology. So um, in, in the very, very early days of human civilization, we had a very humble beginning uh, with very nomadic lifestyle and there's no stable food source. We have, to, we have to go out for hunting and there's no fixed residence for us to form communities, etc. And with the ingenuity of, uh, of humans, we had the first uh, revolution, which was the agriculture. And uh, that gave us stable food source, such that we can have fixed residence, we can start to form societies and civilizations. And uh, <clears throat> after 2000 years, we had our second revolution uh, with the invention of steam engine. And uh, which started a uh, very capital intensive uh, mass production uh, activities and um, uh, enable us to uh, transition into an industrialized uh, society. Uh, the downside of that revolution was that um, we sort of lost our individuality and it's very capital intensive and uh, we have to use mass produced products. And a few hundred years later, uh, we had our third revolution, which is uh, triggered by the invention of personal computers or personal computing. This technology uh, democratized information, and we had new, uh, numerous startups uh, that you know were just founded by a couple of gigs in uh, in college dorms. I'm talking about Facebook, and uh, the the capital control was lessened, and people. Are, getting more and more entrepreneurial, et cetera. So if you look at timelines, we were in this uh, nomadic lifestyle for you know tens of thousands of years. And uh, then we had agriculture for thousands of years. And then we had an industrialized society for hundreds of years. And now we're into a uh, information society for decades. And so it keeps uh, people wondering what will be next because it's about time for the fourth revolution. So uh, the, um, my personal uh, opinion is that we're going to enter a um, society surrounding personalized fabrication because humans are makers and uh, we make tools to um, you know, make our lives better. And we can make an analogy from personal computing to personal fabrication as well just because uh, personal computing enables us to live a personalized life, uh, you know, emphasize on our individuality with virtual information and personalized fabrication can give us the real experience in a, in a physical real world. And um, so this personalized fabrication is gonna to touch every aspect of our life and uh, including, you know, food, uh, buildings, construction, and uh, everyday consumer products. So um, if you look at the history of uh, manufacturing, uh, it sort has gone a whole full cycle. Um, you know, in, in the very early days, we will have uh, 
family-based uh, workshops. We make sense at home using general purpose machine tools with craftsmen and doing craft production. And then the, the mass production um, uh, significantly uh, increase the product production volume but significantly reduce the product variety. If you can look at this axis here, the X axis is the product variety, the Y axis is production volume. And uh, then, you know, because we're uh, ultimately individualized humans and we don't want to be the same as other people. So there's an inherent demand uh, for us to be different and to have customized product, which uh, calls for, uh, you know, uh, flexible manufacturing lines such that we can have different, for example, cars uh, for does not just produce one model compared to when you started. Uh, for Henry Ford had a famous saying, um, you know, you can have every color as long as it's black. So, um, but, but after uh, a few decades now, we can get all different sorts of cars with flexible manufacturing lines. Now they are retuning, uh, retuning the, the factory to produce ventilators and, uh, and facial masks as well. So um, there's, there's a, there are more and more demand for flexible reconfigurable manufacturing lines that can produce customized products to satisfy individual needs at a massive scale. So, um, and uh, 3D printing is sort of a, uh, regarded as a good solution towards this goal because it's digital and um, yeah, um, it, you know, uh, doesn't uh, care about the complexity of, of the design, et cetera. So, uh, but for, for us to really produce, um, customized products on demand. Uh, there's a long way for us to get there. This is where we are, and this is where we want to be to have on demand digital manufacturing at low cost. And uh, the two biggest barriers standing in the way is the printing quality and uh, printing cost. And uh, so printing quality, there's a lot of people uh, in the world are working on improving, improving the printing quality, inventing different technologies to print high quality product uh, that's comparable to uh, traditional manufactured products. The manufacturing, the printing cost, on the other hand, is, uh, uh, is not emphasized as much, especially in, in the academia. This is one of the reasons uh, why uh, I focus uh, the mission of our lab to focus on developing scalable 3D printing technologies that can really bring down the cost. And, um, so we have developed and uh, explored a, a few different approaches uh, to this uh, lead. And uh, so today, because of uh, the time, uh, I'm gonna touch up on a couple of them, uh, including a swarm 3D printing platform and the microheater array powder centering process. So um, the, I imagine, uh, of you probably have uh, uh, seen some of our 3D printers, and uh, this is a common 3D printer that you see uh, on a consumer market. It typically has a single print head, a print single color, with single materials, with limited uh, printer size, you know, uh, mostly printed limited, uh, mechanical structures, and uh, including both, you know, regular plastics and food, et cetera. So th these are some of the limitations with, with the current 3D printing technology. And um, so uh, uh, inspired by nature about, you know, how a swarm of bees, they actually work together to build their beehives. And uh, similar to humans, we have different people with different activities we work together to uh, build ambitious and massive projects. And so we, we um, look at the, the current 3D printers, we decided, you know, it's good to have multiple uh, printers or robots that can actually work together to have a parallelized manufacturing process compared to this linear paradigm that, you know, is essentially indicated by the term, we call it production line or assembly line, and it's a linear process. 
So we want to have a parallelized nonlinear uh, manufacturing paradigm with many different robots that can work together to, to build products. So uh, we started with 3D printing and uh, we take this printheads out, outside of uh, the box and uh, such that you can actually work together with each other with a mobile platform. So this, uh, this solution uh, enable a lot of opportunities, including cooperative 3D printing. Yeah, you, have, you can have different processes uh, to work together, such as, for example, you can have stereolithography, you can have uh, um, film extrusion, et cetera. And you can have multiple colors with different robots to print different color of materials. You can have multiple materials with different robots carrying different materials. And also it's modular and scalable. You can have, as long as uh, the floor can be extended, you can, you can extend your factory. And uh, in terms of functionality, it can also enable digital assembly and by including some of the kind of place robots uh, to assemble pre-manufactured components such that it's not only limited to what we can print right now. If we want to be able to print everything, it's probably going to still take hundreds of years. Um, but as, as of right now, we can still take advantage of some of the existing production capabilities for, for example, for ICs, for CPUs, these kind of devices that cannot be 3D printed right now to bridge this gap. So uh, we had developed a few generations of prototypes, this is one of the early prototypes where we demonstrated the full a uh, suite of technology that's needed for this idea to work. Uh, the first is uh, mobile 3D printers, and we need mobile printers that can work on a platform, and we need wireless power such that they are not tethered to, to entangle with each other. And we also need a software that can, um, you know, divide up tasks and assign it to different robots, and uh, we also need uh, you know, pick and place robots that can do digital assembly, such that it's a heterogeneous swarm instead of a homogeneous swarm. And uh, we also had uh, had to make it IoT control, such that it can be controlled through the internet and uh, over over a wireless network. This is a, this is a demonstration. This is the floor is giving wireless powers, and the mobile platform is moving omnidirectionally. Etc. So, this is uh, our last uh, iteration of uh, the platform. Uh, this is a demonstration of uh, how two mobile printers can actually work together to print an object larger than themselves. So, uh, this is a mounting bracket that's first divided into multiple pieces and uh, and then assigned it to these two different robots, and they act accordingly based on uh, the code that's generated to print these two mounting brackets. This is, a, this is the first uh, object that's cooperative printed uh, and larger than the printer uh, themselves. And we have posted this, uh, this video online uh, and it has been viewed over 400,000 times now. So in addition to, to the hardware platform, the software is equally important. Uh, in the previous video, you see just two robots working together, but you know, if you want to scale this up to thousands of robots, for example, and you're going to need a, a scaling strategy of how you can actually divide up the task to, and assign the tasks to different robots. So this is an a, a example of you know, an object, you're dividing them into 20 different uh, chunks and then assign it to four different robots. How would these four robots uh, print these 20 chunks? So we develop a mathematical framework to describe this process using a concept of dependency tree and uh, such that these robots can follow the dependencies uh, caused by these geometric constraints and shared uh, resources. And uh, this is a demonstration of how you know, many robots can actually work together to print large objects uh, without conflicting with each other, without collide into each other. And uh, so this is 16 robots that's working together to print the landscape of Arkansas. And um, we've 
has shown that with 16 robots, this can increase the printing speed by at least 11, 11 times. So we've uh, also studied how we can enable a heterogeneous swarm. And sorry. So for heterogeneous swarm, we want to. Uh, we want to demonstrate how different types of robots can actually work together. So this is a case study with you know two types of robots. One is um, a pick and place robot, and the other one is a filament extrusion printing robot. And this is just to show that you can divide up the tasks by um, splitting them in a logical way and assign it to different types of robots so that they can work together. And we actually developed this uh, physical pick and place robot to show that they can uh, accomplish digital assembly uh, tasks by you know, sending GCode command to, to the robots. So uh, in addition to um, the um, pick and place print head, we also realized that we need different types of print heads such that can maximize uh, uh, the potential of this technology because filament has uh, you know limited uh, industrial applications. So the first material we studied was uh, the liquid resins and or photopolymers, which has been widely used in many different industrial applications. So we developed a deposition print head that can actually deposit photopolymers and the QNM at the same time, just working similar to a FDM printer. And uh, so this can be compatible with uh, with the Swarm printing platform. So we've also developed a lot of different print heads for uh, printing hot melt soft gels. And uh, this is a gel that's, uh, that has very interesting properties. Uh, it has a similar density to human tissues and its hardness can be adjusted by changing the recipe and you can be as hard as uh, um, you know bones you can be so as soft as your skins therefore if you can have multiple printers print this material you can potentially simulate uh, the entire humans and uh, but the existing FDM printers are not able to print this material so we had to develop a new different printers to print this uh, software gel and um, this is also a super good uh, optical material as well and we have uh, done a study on how we uh, can use this material as uh, for, for optical circuits and uh, which has been recently published as well so in addition to the regular materials we have also uh, explored how we can actually extend this to food printing and because uh, the uh, personalized food is going to be uh, the next milestone for how we transform our relationships with food because food is uh, extremely personal and uh, yet we have not been able to personalize food and uh, with 3d printing you can potentially customize the nutrition and uh, you know the taste, the texture, and everything uh, that's needed for uh, maximizing the, the personal health. And uh, so we developed a print head just to demonstrate that we can include the full print head in the swarm uh, platform, such that in the future we can have a restaurant that can be consistent of you know, for example. 500 robots, they're going to print based on the recipes you give them and deliver the dishes to you. And uh, so we're also working on a few other types of different printers that can work with this swarm print platform, including copper tapes, carbon fiber, and even metals. And we're also working on autonomous planning for software for heterogeneous. Um, uh, jobs and swarms and um, another opportunity we're exploring is to use vision-based diagnostics and reinforcement based learning to uh, do feedback control of this whole printing process to improve its robustness and also cybersecurity uh, to make sure this whole 
uh, cyber manufacturing platform is secure. Uh, we're exploring applications of blockchain to secure the digital thread. So that's uh, the swarm printing technology we have explored so far. And uh, another technology we have uh, explored is to improve the printing speed of selective laser centering. For selective laser centering, you have the single laser scanning point by point to center the powder particles. So uh, our idea is that we want to be able to print a layer at a time instead of one point at a time to speed up the process. And uh, so uh, with, with that in mind, we started thinking about what kind of energy source we can use. And we set it on a microheater. So a microheater is uh, uh, something you know, similar to the stove in your kitchen, um, but except it's a thousand times smaller. So we can make an array of these microheaters, uh, extremely low cost uh, in mass production and uh, on a single chip. And um, so they, you know, you can make it to be uh, 100 micron in diameter or smaller, um, such that you can individually activate them um, and to project a heat pattern um, onto the powder bed uh, to deliver uh, a, uh, to, to print a print a pattern. And uh, this is, this is the illustration of how when this uh, printer head moves in this direction, the pattern can be printed with with uh, the powders. So one of the fundamental premise uh, of this concept is that heat is pretty localized. Heat doesn't travel very far, and um, with small heat, with very small thermal mass, these microheaters can be heated up and cool down in millisecond time scale, which is comparable to the time scale that's been delivered by, by lasers. Uh, but with thousands of microheaters, you can print much, much faster than a single laser. So this is the activated microheaters, this is center powder. So some of the advantage is, uh, first of all, it's scalable. You can uh, easily include thousands of microheater elements in a single print head without adding additional cost because the manufacturing process is not going to change that much. And it's very low cost print head compared with high cost lasers. And essentially this print head can be made disposable if we must produce it. And uh, the power consumption is extremely low, and uh, each microheater consumes uh, hundreds of milliwatts compared to lasers that consumes hundreds of watts. So it's a thousand times um, energy savings. And in addition to that, uh, the microheater itself is a sensor. You can you can know exactly what temperature it's at. And uh, but laser is an open loop control. It doesn't know how uh, how hot it has you know, increased the temperature of the materials. So uh, potentially these microheaters can deliver much better process control as well. So with, with that concept, we started to uh, you know, test it to say if, uh, if it can really happen. And uh, because there's no high temperature microheaters on the market, we had to design our own. And uh, so, um, to demonstrate the, the concept of scalability, we started with a two by two array of uh, microheaters. So each of these microheaters, they resemble a driving wheel uh, in your car. And <laughs> for, for uh, minimization of uh, thermal stress and um, uh, uniformity of, of the heat. So, um, we use platinum to deposit on glass substrate, and uh, this is a demonstration of how we can actually extend this to to scale into into more microheaters. But we're going to start with uh, two by two array. So uh, with with the design of microheaters, uh, we also designed the packaging of it, trying such that we can extend the control of these microheaters and with, with external circuits and code. And um, so this, this is the die uh, of uh, the microheaters, and this is the microheaters in the center. 
So uh, we designed this uh, fabrication steps, which is uh, the MEMS uh, fabrication steps using standard photo discography, uh, you know, with different types of materials, uh, considering the uh, target specifications we want. We want to target uh, 600 CO for operating temperature. And uh, so the microliters is going to be deposited here, the conductive release are deposited here. Uh, we start. We fabricated that in in a, in a clean room here in University of Arkansas, and uh, this is the fabricated die. And uh, the microliter is in the center here, and this is a glass substrate. This is a gold lid, and um, so we also uh, developed a um, you know uh, packaging techniques to. Um, to extend the conductive release. So this is not this is not designed for mass production. We have a different strategy for mass production of these dyes, but for for prototyping purposes, we you know uh, use this ad hoc method to deposit this conductive release on the side. And uh, then we uh, connect these dyes to uh, the circuit board. This is a circuit board we designed to such that we can control these microheaters individually. And uh, we found that to this PCB packaging, and uh, we mount that to an Arduino board, and which now allows you to write code to control uh, the, the, the microheaters. We designed a temperature control board, which can provide less of the power to heat up the microheaters. It doesn't consume that much, but Arduino is not able to provide that. So we had to design a driver board for these microheaters. And uh, so we did some tests and the, um, this is a single uh, heating uh, test and uh, the X axis is the time, the Y axis is the temperature and uh, we heat up and we implement a feedback control using the microheater as a sensor and uh, to heat up to a target temperature of 600 C. And as you can see here, the temperature rise in a couple of milliseconds to 600 C and the feedback control loop pull it back to 600 C and maintain that temperature and uh, in a few milliseconds. And uh, when, if you're just maintaining the temperature, the, the green line here is the power consumption. It consumes about 400 milliwatts here for, for a single microheater. And we also did a cycle test so that we can heat up and cool down, heat up and cool down multiple times. And you can see here, it stays around uh, the target temperature there fairly well. And to show that this can be uh, flushed, you know, very fast to deliver uh, heat patterns to send the powder particles. So uh, to, to do a proof of concept to test this technology, uh, we uh, started with uh, the first application with flex flexible electronics, and the reason being that um, it's only one layer and um, it's uh, much easier to develop than a real 3D printer for for powder based um, uh, 3D printers. So. Uh, in addition to that, the flexible electronics is a really uh, fast growing big uh, billion dollar industry and uh, it has a lot of benefits, including flexible plastic substrates, lightweight, less volume, less environment impact, and uh, you know, a lot of potential in consumer electronics, automotive, and uh, aerospace. So uh, we Develop or design a prototype of these uh, printers, and this is a printer head, and it, this is what a microheater is mounted. And this is the printing stage. We have the motors that's controlling the printing stage, such that you can feed the powder particles through it. And uh, we we use uh, silver nanoparticles as uh, a test material, and silver nanoparticles melts the the material we're using in melts at about 440C, and uh, our uh, operating temperature of these microheaters is 600 C. So we first spread a thin layer of uh, 
silver nanoparticles on plastic film and feed this plastic film into the microheater and such that the heat can deliver to the silver nanoparticles and uh, center them together. And then we'll wash off this uncentered uh, particles and we can get some patterns. So we started with some conductive lines and then we printed several lines with these powder particles. And then we put it under, under SEM, you can see there's a clear signs of melting and it shows these several nanoparticles are melting and solidify with each other. And it, it delivers quite good conductivity with these conduct lines, uh, this plastic substrate. So one thing uh, you might wonder, you know, uh, you're opening a 600C, how do you operate on a plastic film? Uh, because it's gonna melt. And um, the, the answer is that it does not melt because um, the, the heat does not, the heat mass is so small, it does not penetrate a certain depth. And um, so when, when the heat reaches the plastic substrate, you already decrease it to a much lower temperature that cannot hurt the, um, the plastic film. In addition to that, it operates at a super fast time scale. So those time scale and those energy levels are not sufficient to do any damage to the plastic films. So we did a benchmark comparison with some existing um, printing technologies for printing electronics, including screen printing, which is a long digital uh, printing technology and inkjet, which is a digital printing technology. So we uh, summarized some of the best results in the literature and compared it to our first prototype of maps. And uh, so this is the first prototype and we have done some simulations that suggest we can easily improve the printing speed of this by another 10 times. Um, and um, so, uh, in this uh, situation, we're trying to print a uh, fle flexible circuit on an A4 size of paper. And uh, so, in terms of printing speed, you can see uh, we're clearly uh, at an advantage in both inkjet and the screen printing uh, in terms of total printing time. Because we're a one step process in a traditional printing, you have to print and then do oven curing. You have a cure. This post processing takes a really long time. And uh, so we can say that uh, at a faster printing speed, we achieved a reasonably uh, comparable uh, printing quality, which is measured in the conductivity of the book silver. And so this shows a lot of promise of this technology with, with further improvements. Uh, it can potentially be a viable digital manufacturing technology for flexible electronics. And uh, that's uh, given a time and um, that's all we have. Uh, this picture shows this first printed uh, mounting bracket with two printers uh, working together. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for your attention and I would be happy to take any questions.